glad to see that the warm weather has brought out such a good turnout. <laughs> As today's talk indicates, we shall be learning about the rise of Armenian nationalism and the role of the American missionaries in giving rise to the sentiment to this sentiment amongst the Armenians in the 19th century. The concept of nationalism is both new and old. Modern-day nationalism came to the fore with the creation of the nation-state following the Treaty of Westphalia in the latter part of the 17th century and ga gained its greatest expression during the French Revolution. Although people identified themselves through common history, religion, language, or race, and grouped themselves within, within common geographical boundaries, it was not until the last two centuries that political expression was given to this common identity. Thus it was felt a nation was inseparable from the people and government could be created in accordance with the will of the people. In the 19th century, nationalism became a widespread and powerful force and expressed itself in many areas as a drive for national unification or independence. Thus it is within this context that we see the rise of Armenian nationalism. However, nationalism, nationalism can have both positive and negative aspects, as we can see in the rise of German militaristic militarism that eventually led to the evil Nazi German government. With the breakup of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, we are witnessing the resurgence of nationalism in both its characteristics of good and bad. Thus our lecture today is most timely in that it will deal with the roots of modern day Armenian nationalism and with the overwhelming desire to have a truly independent nation state. Dr. McGarrian comes well prepared to expound on this topic. For those of you who do not know, she has a bachelor's degree in international relations from Brown University and has received a master's and doctoral degrees from Harvard University, where she majored in Russian studies and history. She has been a correspondent of the Quincy Patriot Ledger, been editor of the Army and Mirror Spectator prior to becoming director of information and publications here at NASA. She has served as a research analyst for four years with the U.S. government in Washington, has lectured extensively and has authored numerous articles in addition to being active in several community organizations and has served on the board of the Army and Assembly, the Army and National Women's Association, the Army and Library and Museum of America, and St. Nessa Seminary. Her talk today is based on extensive ongoing research into the missionary archives, and it is my personal hope that eventually all of this will come out in the form of a book. So it is with great deal of pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Barbara McGarrion. Thank you very much, and welcome to all of you. I think that all of you know that as Armenians we're living in very momentous days. We've seen the government of the United States recognize the Republic of Armenia. We've seen the establishment of an American embassy in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. And we've seen the establishment of an Armenian embassy in the U.S. capital in Washington. And under those circumstances, it might be interesting and instructive to go back this evening and look at the first contacts that occurred between large numbers of Armenians and large numbers of Americans. And that occurred when the American missionaries went out to the Ottoman Empire and began their work among the Armenians. And I can't help wondering how the missionaries would feel 
these early pioneers, if they were here with us today and could see the developments that have occurred, I'm sure they could hardly believe it. <coughs> One other thing I think I should say before I begin on a personal note, when people learn that I'm doing research on the American missionaries, they always assume that I must be a Protestant myself. And I think my parents would really want me to say and announce here and now that both of them are very devout Lusa Vorchagan, members of the Apostolic Church. Uh, I admit that as a child my mother did send me to Congregational Sunday School because it was not convenient for us to go to the Armenian Church. However, my father took a rather dim view of this, <laughs> and I think he finally concluded that Congregational Sunday School would not do me any harm and it might possibly do me some good. But he wanted it clearly understood, and I got a lecture every Sunday when I came home from Sunday School, <laughs> that the Congregational Church was a fine institution, but I should never be deluded into thinking that it was a religion, because there was one true religion, and that's the Armenian Apostolic <laughs> Church. <laughs> so that's my background. But the other thing, um, one other personal note I'd like to make um, is that as a young child I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, many of us have. I was devoted to my grandmother, this is my mother's mother. She was a very devout Christian herself. Again, as far as I know, she had been raised in the Apostolic Church. And yet as I look back on her, I see many characteristics that I can't help but think are Protestant. I'm not sure. It's difficult to put your finger on it, but certain things that she did. For example, my grandmother was always after me to do needlework. You know, young ladies are supposed to be able to crochet and embroider. I had mixed feelings about it. I would rather read a book. But the funny thing was that on Sundays, my grandmother wouldn't let me do embroidery or crochet or needlework because Sunday was a day of rest and you weren't supposed to do anything that wasn't absolutely necessary. And I had a hard time understanding this. I couldn't see what was wrong with sewing. I mean, it wasn't as if we were gambling or something. But she was very strict about that. And I do think that was a Protestant influence because one of the things, someone's shaking their head here, but one thing that the missionaries did stress when they went out in the villages was that Sunday was a day of rest and there was not to be done any extra work on Sundays. They themselves would not travel on Sundays, often at great inconvenience. The other thing my grandmother did, and again, it may or may not be a Protestant influence, but like all good housekeepers, she was a workaholic. She was up at the crack of dawn. It was either washing or ironing or cleaning or baking. <coughs> But every day at 10 o'clock, everything would stop. She would go into her room and she would read the Bible. And no one was to disturb her under any circumstances. It didn't matter whether we had guests. It didn't matter whether we were in our house or her house, wherever she was. She went into her room. She read the Bible for half an hour, three quarters of an hour. And then she was ready to continue with her day. As I say, I can't prove that those are Protestant influences, but my grandmother did come from Mezida, which is very close to Harpet, and Harpet was one of the largest missionary centers in the Ottoman Empire, so I don't know. But these questions have led me to question, what are some of the indirect influences of the American missionaries? We know they're direct influences, but weren't there indirect influences that they had on the Armenian people? And how can we identify these? And how can we assess these? And that's really my basic interest in this question. Uh, before talking specifically about the impact of the American missionaries on the Armenians, perhaps a word or two is in order concerning the American missionary movement in general. The outgrowth of the religious awakening that took place in America in the early 1800s, the missionary movement was an idealistic, almost romantic campaign to save souls around the world for Christ. 
The American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which was the first American missionary group to send Americans to the Ottoman Empire, and which remained by far the largest American organization engaged in missionary work in Turkey, was incorporated in Boston, Massachusetts in 1812 for the purpose of propagating the gospel among those who are destitute of the knowledge of Christianity. Though most of the founders were affiliated with the Congregational Church, the American Board was an ecumenical organization, and it included, at first at least, Presbyterians and Reformed Dutch and other denominations. The first American missionaries to go abroad were sent to Hawaii and then to India. In 1819, that's only seven years after the board was established, in a burst of enthusiasm to restore Christianity to the Near East, a mission to Palestine was established, and two men were sent out to Boston to explore the new field. The new mission was undertaken with a spirit very reminiscent of that displayed by the Crusaders in the Middle Ages. According to the missionary historian James Barton, writing in 1908. There was in the minds and hearts of American Christians not a little of the spirit of the crusaders of the Middle Ages. Why should the soil trodden by the feet of the prophets and apostles, yes, even by the Lord himself, remain a stranger to the voice of the preacher of righteousness and untouched by the feet of the modern apostle? The instructions given to the first missionaries to Turkey dwelt upon this impressive and moving fact, as did the early letters of the missionaries. Unlike the Crusaders, these aimed at a purely spiritual conquest, but in included the Christian subjugation of all races and peoples. Well, now the object of the Palestine mission, as most of you know, was the Jewish population and secondly the Muslim population of the Ottoman Empire. Work among the Armenians was not on the missionary agenda. Armenians certainly did not qualify as a people who were destitute of the knowledge of Christianity, as the American Board's charter had stated. But the attention of the Americans was very soon directed to the Armenians because of one characteristic that the Armenians have long exhibited and continue to exhibit according to all reports that we receive from Armenia. <coughs> And that is a deep love and respect for the Bible, the Word of God. Already in India, the American missionaries had come across Armenians who were interested in procur procuring Bibles and in talking about the teachings of the Bible. The Armenians were even engaged in missionary activities in India. You could imagine how excited the Americans were when they discovered an Armenian Christian called Hoannes Lazar working in a Baptist mission in Bengal. He was engaged in the preparation of a version of the scriptures in the Chinese language. We are told that Lazar was translating into Chinese from the Armenian Bible, although he knew English as well. Now whether this Armenian's project of translating the scriptures into Chinese was ever completed and what became of it, I do not know, but it was this kind of thing that attracted the attention of the Americans to the Armenians and aroused their interest. Now when the Americans came to the Near East in 1820, even more so than in India did they come across Armenians who were interested in their work. In fact, finding their way to Jerusalem, the missionaries reported that more Armenians were in attendance during the Holy Week services than that of any other Christian denomination. Similarly in Beirut, the American missionaries attracted Armenians who were passing through either as traders or going and coming on pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And once again, Armenians were the chief customers of the Bibles and the tracts that the missionaries were selling and giving away. Then, even while still in Beirut, the first three people in the Middle East who became converted to evangelical Christianity were Armenians, all three of them former Armenian clergymen. Now, uh, we mentioned the grandiose plans of the missionary offices in Boston to convert the world to evangelical Christianity. But Boston provided very little practical help to the missionaries as to how to go about doing this. 
That is, arriving in a strange land, how do you preach the Bible in languages you don't understand to people of a totally different historical background and culture? The ideal of the missionaries was that of St. Paul and the apostles, to go out and preach the gospel. But it was one thing to decide to do that in Boston in a burst of enthusiasm, and it was another thing to be in the middle of, say, Beirut or Jerusalem and to try to go out and preach to the people. But as the Americans did find their way through these strange countries, again, it was the Armenians who were at least open to them to some extent, willing to talk to them and, and try to um, discuss their philosophical truths. The Americans were impressed with the Armenians' knowledge of many languages their far-flung contacts in many lands. And so the Americans conceived of the idea of using the Armenians as assistants in their work. To be sure, the Armenian apostolic religion posed a problem. The missionaries didn't approve of it very much, but this was not considered a serious drawback. Wrote William Goodell, who was the first American missionary to the Armenians. He wrote of the Armenians, give them the incorruptible seed, the word of God, and they will transport it with their other commodities to every country. So the Armenians were seen as helpers. And because of the potential of the mission to the Armenians, especially where the missionaries were getting nowhere in their work with the Jews or the Muslims or the Greeks, they naturally turned to the Armenians and poured large resources into the programs for the Armenians. But the Americans never lost sight of the fact that the Armenian mission was not an end in itself, but it was a means to the larger end of converting the Jews and the Muslims. And this must always be remembered in trying to understand the missionaries or in trying to assess the missionaries. The Armenian mission was not their final goal. So the mission to the Armenians was established in 1830 when the Reverend Goodell was sent to Istanbul to work among them. Goodell was soon followed by others, notably Reverend Dwight, John Adger, and Cyrus Hamlin, who all went out in the 1830s. Incidentally, these were very well-educated people. They had been to top colleges in the United States. <clears throat> Adger was a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Cyrus Hamlin had been to Bowdoin College and um, William Goodell uh, was a graduate of the Andover Theological Seminary. At the same time, a decision was made to procure Armenian type so that the missionaries could start printing in the Armenian language. Thus, the station established in Istanbul in 1830 had expanded by 1845 to include Smyrna, Brusa, Trebizond, and Erzurum, and occupied 34 Americans. In 1846 came the excommunication of the evangelicals from the Armenian Church and the establishment of the Protestant Church and the Protestant Millet. By 1852, the mission to the Armenians had become the largest single item in the budget of the American board. By 1860, there was a North Armenian mission with 13 stations, including Istanbul, Smyrna, Tokat, Sivas, Caesarea, Yozgat, Erzurum, Arabkir, Harpet, and 45 outstations. There was a Southern Armenian mission with five stations, Aintab, Marash, Orfa, Aleppo, Antioch, and 13 outstations, including Kilis, Adana, Kesab, Severag. There were a total of 93 missionaries working among the Armenians that year. The mission continued to grow, adding Vaughan in 1872. By 1910, there were 19 stations, 263 outstations, and 164 American missionaries working among the Armenians. And that number continued until the events of World War I. If we had a map here, we would see that these stations really dotted the whole landscape where there was an Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire. So we're dealing here with a massive effort spanning almost 100 years from 1830 until the end of World War I, 1922 or 23. Spread into every corner of the Ottoman Empire where Armenians could be found, occupying hundreds of Armenians, and directed by a mission board in Boston that knew practically nothing about the Armenians. 
We're dealing with a period of rapid political, economic, and social change in the Ottoman Empire and in the rest of the world. The emphasis of mission policies changed over the years. The policies were interpreted in different ways by the individual missionaries. And it really is difficult in a single lecture to do justice so, to so broad a topic. And I have to say that um, I can only provide this evening a general overview of the impact of the American missionaries and leave out much of the refinements and the details. It's, of course, natural to view the Protestants in a religious context because, after all, their purposes were religious. But I really don't want to dwell on that this evening because I think most of you are aware of the impact, the religious impact of the missionaries. Uh, we really can't go into the history that saw the missionaries who initially planned to reform the Armenian church end up, in fact, leaving the Armenian church and forming a new church, the Protestant <coughs> Evangelical Church. I think the most serious charge that I hear laid against the missionaries was that they divided the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire. But I think this argument presupposes a homogeneous Armenian community when in fact the Armenian community was torn, as indeed was all of Ottoman society, by new economic forces, new liberalizing forces that demanded a more open and democratic rule. The Armenian community was already divided and continued to be divided. And it's really difficult to say that the Protestants contributed seriously to that or that the Protestants ever really <coughs> weak, were responsible for weakening the power of the Armenian Patriarchate, which continued to play the very central role in the Armenian community. Moreover, while the Protestant missionaries attracted large numbers of Armenians to their schools, and even to some of their religious programs. Relatively few Armenians actually joined the Protestant church. If we use the missionary figures, they tell us that approximately 10,000 Armenians were members of the evangelical church in the Ottoman Empire by the end of the 19th century, and that went up to a high of 15,000 on the eve of World War I. But if we assume an Armenian population of three million in the Ottoman Empire, as most scholars do, then membership in the Protestant church would be a very small percent, about one half of one percent to be exact, according to the Protestants' own figures. So it seems to me that if we're going to look at the impact of the missionaries, we have to look elsewhere than in the um, evangelical church itself. And I would like to suggest that the non-religious impact was more important in many ways. And I would like to look at some of those, remembering that these are difficult to define and to assess. And to look at the overall non-religious impact of the missionaries, you have to remember, first of all, that they were congregationalists and Presbyterians who believed that the road to Christian truth could be found by reading the Bible, especially the Gospel, and that's all that was required. Theirs was an individualistic religion in which every person develops a direct relation with the Savior. They didn't see the need for church or pastors or anyone else as intermediaries between the individual and God. Yes, they had prayer services and church services and Bible study groups and pastors, all designed to help the individual. But the bottom line was that the individual had to find God in his or her own way. And the prerequisite to do this was that the Bible be available and that the people know how to read the Bible and also that they have enough outside information that is enough knowledge of history and geography and logic and even sciences so that they could interpret the Bible in a way that the missionaries thought was correct. So that education became an integral part of the movement from the very beginning. However, the first step then was to uh, look to distributing Bibles in Armenian and to ch teaching the Armenian people how to read Armenian. And right here, the missionaries ran right into their first and one of their greatest obstacles. And that was to discover that the Bible, 
the Armenian Bible, and the church liturgy were in the classical language, the Kurapar, a language which the missionaries considered unintelligible to the average Armenian unless he or she had a high level of education. The missionaries would visit Armenian schools and they would listen to the students read passages in Kurapad and then they would ask them questions and they would find that the students had not understood at all what they had been reading very fluently. Now this was not a problem unique to the Armenians. It's something that the missionaries found everywhere in the Middle East and it was extremely vexing. They simply could not understand it. Describing the linguistic dilemma to his American supporters, the Reverend Goodell wrote that the average person in the Middle East, quote, knows not what he prays, the prayers always being an unknown tongue. Those at Constantinople who pray in Arabic speak only Turkish. The Maronites of Mount Lebanon who speak Arabic always pray in Syriac, a language they understand not. The Greeks pray in ancient Greek, the Armenians in ancient Armenian, the Jews in Hebrew, and the Catholics in Latin, the few Christians found in Egypt and Coptic, all of which to them are dead languages. Whenever they have any business transactions with their neighbors about temporal or trivial matters, they are always careful to speak in a language which they understand. But whenever they have any business with their maker about their eternal interests, it is always done in a language which they understand not. Now, the uh, Americans <coughs> observed that most of the Armenians with whom they came into contact spoke Turkish. And they initially decided to use Turkish in their work among the Armenians. That is, not Turkish with the, not the Ottoman Turkish, but what is called the Armeno-Turkish, that is Turkish written with the Armenian letters. Now this language had a lot of advantages from the missionary point of view, because even though they were working among the Armenians using this language, it was a language that the Muslim Turks understood. And if you have a Bible in Armeno-Turkish, theoretically, if it's read to a Turkish person, they can understand it, or it's very easy to teach them the Armenian alphabet so they can read it themselves. So that the um, missionaries hoped that they could work in Armeno-Turkish, and they did, in fact, begin to translate the Bible into Armeno-Turkish and to publish various tracts in Armeno-Turkish. But it soon became very clear that this was not an appropriate language to work among the Armenians, who after all had a, a Christianity that went back so many years and was so bound with the development of the Armenian language. So the Americans therefore turned their attention to the study of the Armenian vernacular language, that is the spoken language and not the um, the classical language. Now, this was not a written language at this time. And uh, as uh, the Reverend Cyrus Hamlin later recalled, it was a rough, rough, uncultivated language. He's talking about the 1830s now. The idea of translating the Bible into such a language was ridiculed. But the missionaries were never to be daunted by ridicule. So they moved ahead, translating first the Book of Psalms into modern Western Armenian, then the Gospels and the New Testament, finally the entire Bible. But they did find the language was changing, and they had to change as the language changed because it was different from one province to the next. It was different from one year to the next. Um, the Reverend John B. Adger, who was in charge of the Armenian printing press at Smyrna, was a pioneer in the work and uh, later wrote about it in his memoirs. With the aid of Armenian assistance, he translated the Pilgrim's Progress into Armenian, and it subsequently became widely used as a textbook. And uh, they printed tracts and Bible stories and a catechism. But Adger describes the process that the missionaries used in translating into modern Armenian, which is rather interesting. They had attracted a group of young Armenian men who I think were really more interested in learning English than they were in learning the truths of the Bible. But the two groups used each other. The missionaries would learn Armenian from these young men, and these young men would learn English from the missionaries. But um, Adger just describes one of his top translators, a man by the name of Sarkis Hohanesian. Adger writes, 
I could hardly set anything in our own tongue before him of a construction too difficult for him to transfer in plain and simple words to his own language. His only fault as a translator for the Armenians was a tendency to the use of a somewhat too scholarly style. The popular language of the Armenians was very much corrupted by being mixed with Turkish words, and these Sarkis, like every other intelligent Armenian, abhorred. They were so many badges of his people's ignorance and servitude to the Muslim that the vocabulary of the modern Armenian should widen as well as become purified if education was to make any progress amongst the people was a necessity. Their language must have the words dug out from the disuse of centuries under whose ruins they were lying because they had need of these words to express the new ideas they were beginning to entertain. Sarkis knew this. So did all the few intelligent scholars that remained amongst them. So did the American missionaries, and therefore we were tolerant of some degree of that elevation of his style which the scholarly taste of Sarkis could not help indulging. We have many similar passages to that in the other uh, missionary, Cyrus Hamlin, the great educator and founder of Bibex Seminary, says uh, the same thing. Um, Hamlin makes a rather extravagant claim for the missionaries and the Armenian language. Uh, summarizing the development of the language in that period, Hamlin wrote, We found it clay and iron, and we left it gold. I only claim that the seminary at Bebek had a part in an honorable part an honorable part in the renaissance of the language. The entire influence of the mission went in that direction. Now, the missionaries did not develop the use of modern Western Armenian because they thought it was a wonderful language or because they thought the Armenians should use uh, it or because they were nationalists or for any of those reasons. It was simply a basic practical reason fundamental to their belief that one's native language, one's native tongue, must be one's chief instrument of thought and expression. It would have been the easiest thing in the world for the missionaries to learn English, to uh, use English in their work. They would not have had to translate all these works. They would not have had to study all these languages. Uh, they, they would not have had to go on through this training, years, training period of two or three years before they could become fluent in the languages. And the Armenians were anxious to learn English. They wanted to learn English. In fact, you have the Armenians begging for English classes and the missionaries saying no. But it was a matter of principle for them. And there was no question but that the basic education had to be in Armenian. Now, it is true that there was some debate about higher education, whether they should teach English in the colleges and the um, higher educational institutions. But that's a separate topic, and I don't, don't want to get into that. And of course, in the areas of Cilicia, such as Marash and Aintab, where the Armenians spoke armeno turkish and that was their first language, the missionaries used armeno turkish there. They wanted the people to use the basic language that they were born with and were most comfortable with. I think the missionaries themselves perhaps exaggerated their role in the development of modern Western Armenian, but there can be no doubt that they played a significant role. They were the first to propagate and popularize the idea of a written Western Armenian vernacular language. <clears throat> they did so much earlier than the celebrated debates among the Armenian intellectuals, the so-called ancients and the moderns, that took place later in the 19th century. They wrote the first grammar books in modern Armenian. They published the first periodical <clears throat> in modern Western Armenian, and they were the first to teach it in their schools. <coughs> Their press rolled out thousands and thousands of pages in Western Armenian. They thought of all kinds of innovative ways to teach people how to read, not only in their schools. Um, they would uh, take older women who, whose family responsibilities had declined and teach them how to read and get them to go into other homes and read the Bible and teach other women how to read. Or they would take the small children from their schools and give them a few pennies and ask them to go out and teach their mothers or the other women in the neighborhood how to read. Unfortunately, for all the voluminous statistics they kept, the missionaries never tried to count the number of Armenians who became literate through their efforts. But the numbers must have been enormous. 
A large Armenian reading public had been created, created to be sure for the purpose of reading and studying the Bible, but once literate, these Armenians, these students, and became an audience for every kind of reading material, whether political or literary or whatever. Now, the uh, impact in the teaching of the Western Armenian language was, of course, just one part of the larger educational effort of the missionaries. And I don't want to go into this either, because I think most of you are probably familiar with the vast network of elementary schools and boarding schools, secondary schools, and colleges that they developed. Again, although they thought religion, they looked at um, education in very narrow religious terms, just their whole philosophy was that people had to learn history and geography so they could read the Bible properly. They had to learn sciences in order to counter superstition. Uh, they had to learn logic, and they had to learn God's order in the universe. Just a couple of observations on education. The popularity of the missionary schools for an Armenian population that had been largely deprived of educational opportunities for centuries compelled the apostolic church to expand its own educational facilities in order to compete. And secondly, just to, to get a flavor of this education, I want to just read to you the curriculum from the Harpet Female Seminary. This was adopted in 1878. This was a four-year course with a preparatory year for those who needed it. But the classes were conducted, as I said, in Western Armenian. The preparatory year, the students studied the Gospel of Luke, mental arithmetic, I suppose that was a um, multiplication table and that sort of thing, grammar as far as the verb, reading, writing, and spelling. <coughs> the first year, the students studied the life of Christ, written arithmetic, uh, the grammar of modern Armenian, geography, Armeno-Turkish, reading and spelling. The second year, the courses included history of the church, arithmetic, ancient grammar, that's Karapad, and translation of the Armenian Bible, Armeno-Turkish, physiology, and English. Third year, Old Testament history, algebra, Karapad Armenian, and the translation of Yelisha's History of Armenia, English, Astronomy. Fourth year, Old Testament History continued, Wayland's Moral Science, Natural Philosophy, History, English, Evidences of Christianity. Throughout the course, vocal music, calisthenics, that was an innovation, composition and recitation, plain and ornamental needlework, arithmetical chart, and to all who write well, drawing. You can see that it's a very basic kind of no-frills education, uh, very heavily um, concentrated on languages. Now this brings us to a third area of impact of the Protestant missionaries, and one that's interested in me quite a bit, and that's their programs to improve the status of Armenian women. Now there were many factors that uh, impel the missionaries to work in this field. First of all, one of the perceived benefits of evangelical Christianity was its liberal attitude toward women, liberal at least for the time. Saving the souls of women was considered just as important as saving the souls of men. Second, from the very beginning, American women played a very critical role in the missionary movement as donors, as wives of missionaries, and later as missionaries in their own right. The Protestants prided themselves that their missionaries went out accompanied by their wives, who actually had an assignment as assistant missionary, unlike their chief rivals, the Catholic missionaries. And while the first duty of the missionary wife was to keep a Protestant home for her husband, wives were designated as missionaries and were expected to work among the local women. <coughs> American women strongly supported missionary programs for women, and um, when the men appeared to be dragging their feet, the American women established their own boards, raised their own money, and sent their own missionaries to do what they called women's work for women. Finally, the education of Armenian women was developed because the shortage of teachers and helpers in the field required the use of women teachers. But progress in this field was very difficult. 
It was easy enough to start an elementary school and have girls as students, but establishment of secondary or higher education for Armenian women proved much more difficult. For one thing, girls got married at a very early age, 11, 12, or 13, and it was very common for promising students in the missionary uh, girls' schools to be taken out because their parents had arranged for them to be married against their wishes. Uh, the missionaries tried to discourage these early marriages, particularly against the girls' wishes, not with very much success. In one publicized incident in Marash in 1874, the missionaries encouraged a young student at the Protestant High School for Girls to refuse to marry the man to whom she had been betrothed by her parents. The girl was granted her wish to remain in school only after the mission station appealed to the Turkish authorities. They had decided to make a test case out of it, and apparently it was quite a publicized incident, but it really didn't help that much. Missionary attempts to raise the marriage age for Armenian women met with only limited success. Establishing the principle that single Armenian women could be teachers was another uh, problem. It simply had not been done, and people would not accept it at first. In 1864, in Marash, for example, Mrs. Josephine L. Coffing organized a girls' school and placed a young woman in charge of it. So great was the local opposition that when Mrs. Coffing returned the next year, she found that nearly all the pupils had left and the teacher was greatly discouraged. Mrs. Coffing reported, The men called the teacher a brazen-faced thing for trying to teach, a thing that no woman could do. The women called her crazy because she did not improve her opportunities for matrimony. Some called her proud, some accused her of wishing to become a Frank, and all turned from her with scorn and cutting indifference. But despite these problems, once uh, women began to teach, it very quickly became accepted. Once people saw that women could teach, the resistance very quickly broke down. In Marash, 15 years later, there were 10 schools taught by women, and there were similar experiences in all the other areas uh, where the Protestants were active. In fact, uh, in 1888, Reverend Crosby Wheeler, reflecting on the 30 years that he had spent in Harpet as a missionary, said that he thought the greatest change brought about by the missionaries had been in the attitude toward women and acceptance for education for women. So that became one of the distinguishing features of the um, missionary uh, movement. On the whole, the missionaries refrained from introducing social change. They made no major attempt to introduce Western dress or Western food or Western housekeeping unless there was a good reason. They did try to teach elementary principles of cleanliness and they taught Armenians to boil drinking water during epidemics, for example. In the early days, they had introduced some Western customs, but had come to regret it. For example, the missionary women um, were rather appalled when they saw the Armenian custom of swaddling the babies, like mummies, as they said. And they were very proud of the fact that they dressed their babies in these pretty little dresses, and initially encouraged some of the Armenian women to do the same. But it was soon discovered that in the rural conditions that the babies dressed in dresses were more subjected to drafts and became ill more easily. And they were really healthier if they were swaddled. So um, there was a, a reluctance to change some of these um, social um, conditions without a good reason. Also in the field of social welfare, there was very little at first because the Americans were told to concentrate on religious teaching only. It was only after the Civil War, as missions expanded and women entered the missions, that they began to establish clinics and hospitals and training programs for nurses. In the field of economics, similarly, the missionaries believed that it was not their responsibility to intervene. It was terrible for them to witness the poverty of the Armenian people, particularly when they recognized how naturally wealthy the country was. There's a wonderful passage, a letter written by Reverend George Knapp in Bitlis in the 1870s, when he sees the women, the women and children uh, wandering around, totally lacking warm clothing. 
Now this is an area where there is a lot of sheep, a lot of raw wool, but there was no way, no looms, no way to uh, make this wool into cloth. Let the carter, spinner, and loom be brought here, and the naked will be clothed, he wrote. But any kind of this economic activity was shunned by the missionary board in the fear that it would detract from the spiritual nature of the mission. The Reverend Cyrus Hamlin was a conspicuous exception to this rule. He could see no advantage in having his students be starving and ill, ill-fed Ill and ill-clothed. And he embarked on a series of enterprises to allow his students to earn money. He made rat traps, iron stoves, he, entered, he began a laundry business and bread baking and made really a lot of money both for his students and for himself. But the board um, refused to accept his profits and he was forbidden to continue this kind of activity. Looking at the political arena, the impact of the missionaries was, again, very indirect and difficult to assess. The official policy was to avoid any political teaching or political involvement. The missionaries strictly adhered to the Bible teaching, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. But again, the reality differed. The Protestant emphasis on individualism, the belief that each person has the ability to think for themselves, to read and interpret the Bible, without the need for authority, easily transported into support for democracy in the political arena, especially in the Armenian millet, which was dominated by the Amiraz, or the wealthy uh, families. The emphasis on rationalism, on man's responsibility for his own destiny, supported a reform mentality. The missionaries were proud and patriotic Americans. Their major holiday was the 4th of July, which they celebrated with the local Armenians. Certainly they explained the meaning of the Declaration of Independence to their Armenian students. They strongly supported the reform decrees of the Turkish sultans in the 19th century, particularly in the field of freedom of religion and of opinion. They were careful to avoid encouraging the Armenian revolutionary movements, the Hunchags and the Tashnags. They favored legal reform along liberal lines. Um, for example, in establishing the Protestant Millet, they established a set of rules of conduct and printed this in Armenian and Armeno-Turkish. This established some of the basic rules that we know of, Robert's Rules of Order kinds of things, the need to have a quorum, to have decisions by majority vote, the principle of popular sovereignty, and all of these things. And in 1860, they very proudly reported that the Armenians had demanded and obtained similar rules in their own millet. And there can be no doubt that they borrowed the idea from our code, the Protestant wrote. Nothing of the sort was ever known before them before. The problem in assessing the impact of the American missionaries on the Armenians arises because they represented only one of several westernizing, liberalizing influences at work in the community, and it's difficult to tell where one started and the other one stopped. The advance of the Armenian community in the 19th and 20th century, the rise in national self-consciousness, the reform movements, the rapid growth in education were caused by a number of factors of which the missionaries were only one. There were liberal ideas coming to Turkish Armenians through the reform movement in Russia. Uh, reform and liberal ideas were coming from Europe, from the many students who were sent abroad to study in Europe in this period. And it was a combination of these factors that resulted in the Armenian Renaissance of the 19th century. Let's just take one article from the Armenian National Constitution of 1860, a document which historians recognize as the work of Armenian liberals who had been educated in Europe and had come back to um, the Ottoman Empire and had prepared this constitution for the Armenian community. This article refers to the need to spread equally among boys and girls of all ages of maturity the knowledge of things which are necessary for mankind. It could be a European manifesto, 
It might just as easily have been written by the Protestant Americans. And I think this herein lies the significance of the Protestant influence on the Armenians. It reinforced, even if it did not bring about, the liberal ideals of the new class of Armenians educated in Europe. It provided support for the development of the Western Armenian language and a reading public for literary works as well as reform and revolutionary writings. <clears throat> the spread of literacy among the rural Armenians can be directly traced to the Protestant educators, to their insistence on the use of the vernacular Armenian and to their publications. Thus, while there is a sense in which it can be said that the American missionaries divided the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire by creating a separate church, it can be argued that in a much larger sense, the American missionaries reinforced the growing concept of Armenian identity and of Armenian national self-consciousness in the 19th century, a concept of identities whose effects we continue to experience today as Armenia moves forward to assert her national existence and identity on the world stage. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, we're ready for questions, if there are any. I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about your grandmother going into and reading the Bible. Now, what kind was the Bible? Was it in Armenian uh, Krapa no, or Charpa? it was Western Armenian. See, there it is, the influence of the Protestants right into her yes, life. Yes, yes. It was one of those big Bibles where you wrote the verse and deaths in the back, yeah. yes. <laughs> so you see, uh, you said she was uh, very much uh, a uh, uh, and yet, she was reading the mm -hmm. Bible. Uh, undoubtedly, she was influenced by it. One other point, if I may, uh, it didn't stress that Cyrus Hamlin came as a missionary, but <coughs> when he saw the need for education, he gave up that role, and people don't know, thought from Ebex Seminary, he established Robert College, which became the most outstanding university in, uh, so in uh, uh, Turkey when it came to learning uh, English and so on. People I've known, people who came from directly from Robert College into mm -hmm. Boston Colleges. Well, Cyrus Hamlin was undoubtedly an outstanding man and an outstanding educator and this, uh, an example of the really <laughs> talented kind of uh, American who got into the missionary field. Uh, he actually got in, involved in the debate over the use of English in the colleges. And when the American board in the 1850s absolutely forbade the teaching of English, he thought that was wrong. And that's when he left the board and uh, established Robert College. Another important thing, the Armenian Patriarchate in Istanbul objected greatly to the Protestant schools and Protestant teachings. And Armenians who went to the Protestant church were, lost their jobs. So Cyrus Hamblin began this uh, bread cooking and uh, washing, and <coughs> fortunately from him, from the point of view of his business, uh, Crimean War broke out, and uh, he began to do all the washing and cooking for the bread for the uh, uh, Crimean <coughs> War soldiers. So that's how he got into the business in such a big scale. Yeah, I mean the missionaries were an interesting combination of idealists and very practical people when it came down to it. <laughs> yes. I think that a lot of people have a misconception of what nationalism means. People try to define it and I think that the concept of nationalism defies a, a definition. Um, some people feel that uh, common religion, common language, the same traditions are indispensable to a nationalism. I think that there's enough evidence that those things are not indispensable. 
you have two religions, uh, two uh, Christian attitudes in Germany, for example, Catholic and Protestant. You have uh, <coughs> three or four different languages in Switzerland, and yet you have a Swiss nationalism. <coughs> a common blood, uh, a common ethnic background, look at the United States. So none of these are indispensable. I think that the two things that are indispensable, and I'd like to <coughs> tie them into our presentation, which is, which is an excellent one, is that <coughs> there must be a feeling of equality <coughs> among the people. That's one of the prerequisites. They must feel equal, feel equal. They don't have to be equal, but they must feel equal. The other is there must be a quest for sovereignty. Now, in what you have said this evening, clearly, uh, I think that the, uh, the missionary movement encouraged and promoted indirectly, as you suggested, the feeling for liberty and equality. That was manifested in different ways, but was there, uh, to what extent, if any, was there an impact in germinating a development of a feeling for sovereignty by the missionaries among the Armenian people, which would be the second prerequisite, indispensable factor for a nationalism to develop. Well, I mean, you raise an awful lot of very interesting issues. Uh, first of all, when you speak of defining a nation, uh, this was the problem the missionaries faced because in the Ottoman Empire you were defined by your religion and an Armenian was defined by being a member of the Apostolic Church. And when they went to the Patriarch and they talked about their religion, and they talked about going to the uh, Hawaii and uh, uh, propagating a Christian religion among the Hawaiians, and the Patriarch couldn't understand it. He said, well then, what do these Christian Hawaiians, who are they, what are they? And the missionary said, well, they're evangelical Christians, isn't that enough? And the patriarch could not understand it because he associated the religion with the nat nationality. And this was the thing that the missionaries had to fight. And in a funny way, although it was a religious movement, the fact that they insisted that your nation was different from your religion they did lead to a secularization of the society, although that isn't what they were after, and that wasn't one of their goals. Right. But in the, I, I think they um, accomplished a lot of things that they had not wanted to accomplish. Um, I think that the missionaries had a very strong s sense that America was the best country on the face of the earth, that America had the best system. And they couldn't help but bring some of these ideas Across, I mean, it was just part of their character. So when you talk about national sovereignty, the right of people to choose their own government, you know, all of these things were ideas that they brought with them through their own personal well, experience. Did, did Again, indirectly, yes, definitely. Okay. Yes. Why did they forbid the teaching of English? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Why did the missionaries forbid the teaching of English? Um, the missionaries did not want the local peoples to get too educated. They didn't want them to lose their roots. They were afraid if they educated the people too much, they would leave their native villages, they would try to get jobs in the big cities, and they would no longer be of service to their people. And they felt that some of the missionaries felt that their function was not to provide education and that it really was far removed from the educational purposes. A lot of the young people the missionaries educated came to America, uh, went to the best colleges here, stayed in America, didn't want to go back. It was this kind of thing that some of them wanted to discourage, but it was not possible to keep that policy for very long. It just wasn't practical. Okay. Yes. What, what prompted you to stop at that point? <laughs> what prompted you to keep it there and not go forward into the, the 20th century? Well, because we didn't have very much time, and I really, being a historian, I always like to begin at the beginning. Um, 
I mean, I could certainly talk about the 20th century, but, but the missionary movement changed. <laughs> Would you, could you enlighten us on it, you know, on it, a plus to what you have already said? Well, I think the basic change was that it got more into social welfare programs, into teaching, you know, establishing nursing schools and providing um, hospitals and clinics, being more of a social welfare organization instead of a purely religious organization. I also think that the missionaries developed much closer relations with the Armenian church after the massacres of 1895. There were much less hostility and they really encourage the graduates of their schools to teach in the apostolic um, schools. Um, they were often invited to establish Sunday schools themselves in the Armenian churches. Um, I don't know, there are many ways in which the community changed and the missionaries changed. Yes? What happened to the missionaries in the course of the massacres? Eighteen ninety five or nineteen fifteen? Nineteen fifteen. The missionaries felt um, missionaries felt very responsible for the people who were under their jurisdiction. They felt that they were American citizens in the Ottoman Empire and it was the duty of the American government to protect them. So they basically stayed in their stations and they drove the American government crazy because the government wanted to evacuate them. The government was not, uh, could not guarantee their safety. The government did not want to be embarrassed by having American citizens killed in Turkey. And both in 1895 and in 1915, the missionaries refused to leave their posts. They did send their children home in many cases. And there are countless stories of missionaries protecting the Armenians in their care and really standing up to the Turkish uh, authorities who came along. Um, I, I don't know if there's anyone here today, but I always run into people who say they were saved by the missionaries. Um, I think they were very brave people. Uh, maybe it's just a self-confidence that they had. They just thought that nothing, um, nothing could befall them. Um, and miraculously, they lost very few people. They, there were some missionaries killed in 1915, but not very many. And then eventually, most of them became involved in the um, Near East Relief, in the orphanages, because they knew the language and it was natural for them to work with the people. In the case of Van, the missionaries retreated when the Armenians retreated and ended up in Yerevan. Uh, who was it? Dr. Usher, Franz Usher, who stayed and took care of the Armenian wounded, the, the valley of uh, Van, said, we can't protect you if you stay. But he says, I have to stay with my people. And he stayed and took care of all the Armenian wounded and sick and so on. Eventually, his wife died from the epidemic that developed among the Turkish, uh, the Turkish, no, the Turkish prisoners. And he himself became sick and had to be evacuated by a Russian uh, ambulance. So that, uh, but uh, I want to point out one thing, that after 19th, uh, 1895, there were so many orphans among the Armenians where the missionaries found themselves going into orphanages, where in Van, my mother, whose father was killed, my mother and her brother and had to go to American missionary school yes. in Vaughan and get an education there. My aunt was sent to a nationalist school in Vaughan. It's a long story when you remember that Turkey forbade the <coughs> uh, Christian to think onward Christian soldiers <coughs> because that was a, a call to war. Yes, they had <laughs> and incredible censorship, that, yes. And it went further. I understand that uh, a chemistry book, because it has H2O, <laughs> was forbidden because the Hamid II is a cipher. That's what they thought, that H2O means Hamid II is a zero. And, <laughs> and so the chemistry book was forbidden to teach that. You can see the... Yeah. 
uh, negative attitude yeah. of these ignorant people. Yeah. Yeah. I think the American missionaries uh, were not allowed to teach anything about Armenian history. No, they were. They were. No, they were. They did Armenian teach history. They taught Armenian allowed history. It? They did. Their books were censored, but they managed to get around the censorship. They were very clever at that sort of thing. Yes, Ed. Carmen, you mentioned uh, half a sentence, 1840s, 50s, that, that the evangelical church yes. was banned or thrown yes. out the word you yes. exactly used. Yes. What, what form did that take in that, in that stay? Was that protracted ever? Or well, as I mentioned, when the missionaries went to Turkey, they thought they could reform the Armenian church. That was their major function. And they began to attract people to their prayer sessions. And um, there were several features of the Armenian church that they very strongly disapproved of, but they tried to get along with the Armenian church at first. Now, in the 1840s, both the evangelicals and the Armenian Apostolic Church took a hard attitude. And I don't know, it's hard to tell who took the first step. But the patriarch issued a list of articles of faith and required that everybody who was suspected of going to these Protestant meetings should sign this article of faith, um, which really negated many of the Protestant teachings. So um, if they refused to sign this, they were not um, allowed in the church. And what made that very serious is that the patriarch was the head of the millet. He had, uh, as Mr. Amirian said, he had economic power as well as political. If he threw you out of the church, you were also out of a job. And if someone in your family died, he would not let you be buried in the cemetery. Uh, so that if you were... Um, excommunicated from the church, you know, you were in really uh, a lot of trouble. So that is when the evangelicals decided to form their own church. And as to who took the first step, I mean, whether it was the patriarch when he drew up this list of, of statements of beliefs, whether it was the Protestants who told their people, don't sign that in good conscience, you really can't. It's hard to say whose fault it was. But in 1846, the Protestants formed their own church. And then in 1850, they formed their own millet, which meant their people could have their own burial ground and have a job and do some of those other things. But it's a recognized church by the Armenian church. Well, it wasn't then. That's, that's my question. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't it was, then. It was really only in, eight, in 1895 when the massacres broke out. Um, the missionaries who took a very disdainful attitude toward the Armenian church. I mean, they thought it was um, a church of um, outward symbols and not inward faith. I mean, they thought people just went to church and didn't understand what was going on. In 1895, however, the missionaries were very impressed by the strength of the faith of the Armenian apostolics. That is, whether you believe the mis that the massacres were political or, or religious, the fact is, if you were an Armenian, you could save your life by becoming a Muslim. And Armenians did not do that. They stuck to their Christian religion. So all of a sudden, the missionaries thought, well, maybe this Armenian church has something to it after all. Maybe it's not all outward form. On the other hand, the Apostolic Church was very impressed with the help that the missionaries had given the Armenians. They had saved many Armenians. They had stood by the Armenians. After the massacres, the uh, missionaries collected money. They established orphanages. So after that, they became closer. But whether, whether <laughs> to what extent the Armenian Church recognizes the Protestant Church as a church today, I don't really know. I, any, <laughs> anyone? <laughs> I have two questions. You did mention uh, 15,000 yes. Armenians converted. Member, members of the Evangelical Church. Church, yes. Uh, do we have any statistics on the number of schools and attendance people who uh, attended the schools or different organizations that they did establish. <coughs> so that we have a yeah, yes. of a yes. idea of the impact. 
Yes. Questions. It's really hard to total those up. I do have some statistics which I didn't bring with me. But they had hundreds of schools. Oh, yes. And they had thousands of pupils. There's no doubt about that. They had schools that they ran directly, and then they had schools that were run indirectly by the local Protestant community. I have another question. Uh, you said that the board was established here in 1812. In my opinion, any kind of uh, religious movement stems from socioeconomic reasons <laughs> or political <laughs> reasons, rivalry between nations. Uh, are there, is there any light, can you shed into any light into that, uh, you know, at that time around world history, what was happening in Europe and in the United States? And it's, it's a little hard to just believe that these Christians go to other Christians and uh, just merely for spiritual reasons. Yeah. Well, well, the first thing, the first thing to note is that the war, the missionary movement was strongly supported. Okay, but not all Americans supported it. I mean, it was a small segment of the American population, mostly in New England, and New York and New Jersey. And I think, I think this is a case where um, these people were really imbued with um, with religion. Now I think there was a sense in which America was a new nation and America thought it had the perfect society and there was a, a sense that they could go out into the world and take this wonderful, some of the wonderful benefits that they enjoyed um, to other people uh, but I really do think that it was a very idealistic movement that there really wasn't anything in it for the missionaries. They gave up very good lives here. There wasn't anything in it for the board. How about the government? The American government? Well, the missionaries really kept their uh, distance from the government. In fact, the, the missionaries were not too happy with the government. They were not too happy with the American traders. I mean, they went through the Ottoman Empire. The only thing they saw there that was American was rum, and they were horrified by this. Um, I would say that it was probably not until the 20th century that you get maybe some sense of America as a, beginning to be a world power and wanting to um, spread its ideals to other part of the, uh, the world. But I still think it's an idealistic movement. And in fact, someone has said that the whole Peace Corps movement in America has its roots in the missionary movement. I think there's a strain of idealism in America that's always been there and that really can't explain it without looking for the economic motive here. Just one point. You make a strong case for the religious faith of the army, the Christian faith of the army of people. Uh, in your studies, have you come across responsible dissenting views as to how fervently the Armenians have been Christians? Because there are those who would argue that the Armenians are not a very religious people. Well, the missionaries thought that at first. <clears throat> I understand that, but I mean, uh, whether the missionaries thought of that, and maybe they were right, maybe they were wrong, in your view, do you think that the Armenians have been a Christian people? people that believe in the Christian faith. There are those who argue against that. Well, I think it depends on what you mean by the Christian faith. I think there are many ways in which they do well, not. Of, well, let me put it to you. And I don't really... A lot, a lot of people argue that the Armenians are not a very religious people. And they make a strong case. Or that their religion is very superficial. Yes, and it started off superficial. Well, well, that's that's another lecture. That that's, but that's that's really interesting. Yes, Rose. <laughs> All right, one. What was the position of the Ottoman Empire when the missionaries were going into Turkey? The Ottomans, the Ottomans. Uh, the Ottomans didn't care a bit as long as the missionaries stayed away from the Muslims. They couldn't care less as long as they didn't touch the Muslims. 
there were certain things that they wouldn't let the missionaries do. They wouldn't let the missionaries print the Bible in Ottoman Turkish. They would not permit that. But they didn't care if it was in Armeno Turkish. And that's in contrast to the attitude of the Russian government, which would not let the missionaries in and would not let the missionaries operate, except briefly under Alexander I, who was very liberal. But the Ottomans not only let the missionaries work, but they were constantly being harassed by the U.S. government to let the missionaries do their work unheeded. It's, ama it's surprising. It really is. Of course, they discouraged, they did not permit um, the Muslims to attend the missionary institution. <coughs> so in that sense, um, they, they opposed it. But as long as the missionaries worked with Armenians or Greeks or Syrians, uh, they didn't care. And it's too bad. Anyone who hasn't asked a question? I was very surprised. I had always heard of the missionaries and the work that they had done, but the amount of people and outstations that you quoted really shocked me because I had presumed that they were isolated stations in Armenia or maybe one town or etc. Could you tell me in 1915 had that grown at all or at least had stayed to the amount that you uh, quoted yes. in before? Uh, in I, think that I think there probably were somewhere between 150 and 200 American missionaries working among the Armenians in 1950. All over Armenia, not specifically in, say... Uh, in the Ottoman uh, Empire. Right in the Ottoman right, Empire. but not particularly the large uh, uh, concentrations in Kharpet where they had yet brought college. No, no, but Kharpet was considered one of the most successful missionary stations in the world. Okay, it was like a model <laughs> for everyone else. Okay, but there was generally throughout Armenia, so that whenever a missionary would report something, it would be throughout the whole country of Armenia, not an isolated case where something happened here, but it was not generally ex accepted as happening in throughout. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please. Uh, um, uh, Helen. Helen. Uh, yeah, and you're next. Barbara, oh, okay. um, I believe that a good many of the missionaries, and I know there were in Sebastia and Sivas, were physicians, mm -hmm. and they also treated the Turkish yes. families. Yes. And I think perhaps the Ottoman government perhaps uh, appreciated that. Well, you know, the missionaries in the field begged for doctors. They wanted doctors for themselves because here they were in these small villages and there were, there were no Turkish doctors anyway, even if Turkish doctors had, had very much ability. So they begged for doctors not only for themselves, but because doctors were a way of reaching out into the local population and not only the Armenians, but the Muslims as well. And I just want well. to add as a, just a note that um, one of the most successful missionary stations were in Sivas. Yes. Many schools. Yes. Yes, it was. A and during the, uh, both in 1895 and in 1915, there was a Miss Graffin, and mm -hmm. she was a student of law to Dr. I don't know who he is, I can't think of his name, walked with the Armenians as they left their city mm -hmm. and walked mm -hmm. for some days, uh, but then returned and became very ill. You know, the question that intrigues me, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. I wonder if the missionaries were successful in Kharpet because this was the center of the old Polishians going way, way back. The missionaries thought so, and they thought they met some Armenians who actually were, had kept the Polish in faith for all those years, and who, you know, continued to have some Armenian um, Protestant beliefs going way back to that early um, movement. I don't know. I wish I can't prove that, but it's always tempting to um, think that it's true. It's a very tempting theory. Yes, Martin. Uh, did you find a sense of elitism on the part of the missionaries toward the local natives? Very much so. This was obvious. To very much so. In fact, one of the most interesting cases was a man by the name of Christopher Seropian, who was a Protestant, a student in the Protestant uh, schools, came to the United States, went to Yale, a brilliant man, and he wanted to come back to Turkey as a missionary. And when the missionaries learned that an Armenian 
was going to come as a missionary, they were absolutely horrified. And all the missionaries in Constantinople wrote a letter of protest saying that it really was not appropriate. They saw themselves as a certain class, and they saw the Armenians as a lower class. And they, there was a sense in which they didn't want the Armenians to advance, to, to come too far forward. But that's definitely there. Not in all the missionaries, but in a lot of them. Cyrus Hamlin did not sign that letter of protest, but all the other missionaries in Constantinople did. But, uh, one more um, let me get someone who hasn't asked no, yet. This is very important, I think. <laughs> the, fact is, the fact is that the missionaries went to change the Turks into Christians, uh -huh. Uh -huh. not the Armenians. Uh -huh. When they found that the Turkish government would kill any Turk who uh, changed his religion, they were not allowed, they would be shot, killed. Then they went to the Armenians as a substitute. But you have to remember yes. that they w didn't go there for the Armenians. Yes. Yep. At the ballot? I just want to do throw in an observation uh, with yeah. reference to what was driving these missionaries. Yes. Uh, that, 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 uh, my field is American, is Armenian. Uh, the whole issue of missionaries, American missions, is extremely complicated, but the first Americans who came to America, the first Europeans who came to America, were driven very much by missionary impulse, built into America. This whole, especially in the Northeast, the concept of America as God's new Israel, uh, the uh, constant sweeping of uh, revivals, uh, missions to the Indians, missions to each other, to the point where in upstate New York, where Joseph Smith came from, was so swept by revival after revival after revival, it's called the Burnt Over District. Uh, <laughs> missions to the Indians, missions to the Polynesians, missions to the Chinese. The Zulus. Missions to, the, missions to every, anybody you can think of, including each other. But correlating this with, uh, in a simple way, with uh, the economic and political activity is very, very difficult. So David Lovejoy, my son, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, studied that a lot. He's very interested in that. And a lot of other people have tried to do it. And it's, there is uh, there's often some kind of relationship between economic factors and the enthusiasm of missionaries at the moment and the number of missions they generate, but it's, it's very, very complicated uh, and it's a field you can devote your life to. But there's a lot, there's a lot of material on it. Thank you. Yes, Ara. I was just wondering through your reading, uh, what uh, perspectives did the missionaries have concerning Armenians, Turks, and Kurds? What, what views did I have of these people? Could you uh, share any of uh, everything that you discern from your reading? You mean the relations between the people? Uh, so just, just what they thought of them as people. What did they think of well, they very much, as I said, their goal was to convert the Jews and the Muslims. They very much wanted to work with the Muslims and with the Kurds. It was hard to work with the Kurds because they weren't sedentary. But they had this problem where the government would not would not let them. Well, you know, it differed. It differed a lot. I mean, the missionaries were Christian in the sense that they, they, they had good things to say about the Turkish people. They hated the government. They thought the sultan was totally corrupt. But they, certain things they admired in the Turkish people, they admired the fact that they supposedly don't drink. Um, and that the Turks were very hospitable. They felt Turks were people of their word. They felt <coughs> if a Turk told you something, they would never go back on it. Well, this is what they wrote. I'm just, no, I'm just you quoting you. This, this, um, this was their experience. And they did take a very Christian view that these were all God's creatures and that they hoped someday. They just regretted the fact that the Turks and the Kurds were not allowed to participate in their programs. But they didn't they didn't have any hostile feelings toward them. Um, simply that the whole system, the whole political system there was corrupt. And if anything, they felt sorry for the masses of the Kurds and, and the poor Turks. 
they see the Armenians in the same way? Yeah, they see the yes, in fact, one of the reasons that they wanted to work among the Armenians was that they wanted to raise the level of Armenian Christianity so that Armenians would be seen as leading such pure uh, ideal lives that the Muslims would want to convert and become the same religion. They felt that given the current state of the Armenian church, they would be unable to convert. Yes. Uh, did they have anything specific to say about that? Mm -hmm. yes. I'm trying very much to relate everything to everything we've ever heard. I mean, <sighs> it's too much to ask of you, perhaps, but forgive me if I am. Well, they officially they tried not to say anything about politics. They tried to say that the, you know they were a religious movement, and they discouraged the missionaries from getting involved in politics. But between themselves the missionaries couldn't help but to see what a terrible system this was. And although they supported the reform movement, you know there was a very strong reform movement in Turkey. They passed several reform decrees that were never actually put into effect. But I think the missionaries were always skeptical that the Turkish government could be a really reformed government. They always had an element of skepticism. Are there reports to their commission to that effect? I guess there must be because if you're familiar. Yes, but I mean, officially they did support reforms. They wanted Turkey to become a more democratic state. They wanted people to have a voice in the government. Um, they wanted to get rid of the corruption. They wanted Turkey to develop economically. Um, they could see all these wonderful opportunities for economic development, but the people had no capitalistic spirit. Um, but they really tried to stay out of these things, at least publicly. Yeah, well, the reports to the commission head, they had very little to say about that, too? No, they did support the reform movement, yes. Uh, and interestingly enough, they were very close to the British government, which was supporting the reform movement in Turkey, much more so than with the American government that had a rather low profile in Turkey in this period, <coughs> although we had a minister there. So um, they worked closely with the um, British ambassador to try to introduce at least freedom of conscience in the Ottoman <coughs> Empire. They tried to establish the principle that a Muslim could become a Christian and not lose his life, which was the rule in the Ottoman Empire. And the Sultan kept passing a law saying, yes, you can convert without losing your life, but then that would simply be on the books when a practical case came up. Uh, anyone who, a Muslim who converted would be in trouble. And the missionaries really fought very much for freedom of conscience, for um, lack of censorship, freedom of the press. Um, they worked for a lot of these. Can it be that that is the reason why they are so silent now about the denial of the genocide? Is this the reason you would attribute to them that they are so quiet, they have done nothing about confirming or anything, they've been so quiet about everything? Well, I'm talking about the missionaries. I'm talking about the missionaries. The missionaries, um, I think, worked very hard to have the genocide recognized right during the war and immediately after the war. But then, you know, to understand the missionary philosophy after World War I, and this is why I say you have to always remember that their major goal was converting the Turks. So after, when they saw that the Armenian case was hopeless, they thought at least maybe they could now begin to work among the Turks. And that's why they soft-pedaled, uh, after the Treaty of Lausanne, they soft-pedaled their work for the Armenians and um, hoped that they could work in Turkey. But of course, it didn't work out. They were no. unable to work in Turkey. Yes? Was it all an American movement, or was there a European component? I have to give another lecture. <laughs> Actually, the um, the English the English were missionaries in the Middle East before the army before the Americans went in, but the British had a different philosophy. They did not go out and try to convert the natives. They did um, distribute Bibles. They published Bibles. The British and Foreign uh, Missionary Society distributed Bibles in the Ottoman Empire. The Americans were helped very much by the English when they first went there. At least there were a few English missionaries working there. There were many fewer English. There were some Germans. 
Later on, there were some Swiss. There were French. Of course, there were Catholic missionaries. Jesuit. Yes, but all of them were on a much smaller scale. And the British, for example, did not try to convert. They tried to work within the existing church. I'm going to... Thank you. <laughs> I think Barbara, well, I think Barbara, you're going to have to give another lecture some other time, <laughs> perhaps next year. Uh, I, I gather from all the questions and the interest that uh, we really touched upon something that all of you were interested in, and uh, I would urge you also to think in terms of coming to our next program, which is on May the 7th, on a Thursday evening, where Professor Hutchick Tololian of Wesleyan University in Connecticut will be coming here to speak on whither the Armenian diaspora. And he'll be discussing the issues that have been now brought up in view of the new relationship between the diaspora and Armenia in, 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 uh, as an aftermath of its independence. And what are the needs now? What are the problems? Uh, who will exert what on whom? Uh, he has some very challenging questions that he will address, and he's particularly anxious to have audience participation following his presentation. So I hope you'll keep our May the 7th on your calendar and come that day because I think you'll find a very stimulating program.